welcome. Um, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, so this talk is about my learning journey through functional programming. Um, and I'm expecting that many beginners to FP go through the same things that I did. And the intent of this talk is to show you um, that it's not, it's not a unique thing that you're going through and maybe even give you some helpful tips or advice to help you along the way and hopefully inspire you to learn FE. So this is more of a learning to learn kind of talk rather than teach you about FP. Um, so beginning uh, with my introduction to FP, a bit of a background. So I have uh, I've done front-end development before. So I have a bit of a mobile development background. Um, and then uh, in REA, I get the chance to join another team. And I chose this back-end team uh, with highly competent wow. people. Um, doing functional programming in Scala. So the code base that we have in that team is basically a lot of functional code. Um, and I, I kind of look up to this team and was really excited to join them. Um, so I had this um, post situation going on where I'm really excited and keen to learn FP, but also very anxious um, because the FP community to me at that point in time was uh, a bit elite, uh, a bit secretive. I don't know what they do sort of thing. Um, so uh, to begin with, like, how did my learning journey go? So how did I start learning? It, it started as usual with any programming language that you do. Um, I started with books. Uh, I did a lot of video tutorials, thousands of blog posts, um, and also even YouTube videos, YouTube tutorials, because why not? Um, and my learning graph kind of looked like that, not good. There was a lot of ups and downs, and it basically sort of reflected my interest in learning FP. Um, I, would, I would learn a, or grasp a concept, uh, and then I would be at the peak, and I would be uh, excited to go back to the company, start using what I've learned. And then I'd come across someone who says something like, oh, you don't mean mono monads, you mean monoids. Oh, so they're different. Um, Things like there, there, there's this jargon and this language that uh, people use when talking about FP that kind of immediately um, attacks your confidence and it goes, it goes down immediately. Um, so I sort of sat down and tried to identify where I was having problems with like um, my learning journey and I came up with these, with these points. Um, and the first glaring, glaringly obvious fact about FP is the jargon that they use. Um, and it's sort of like all over the place. You, it, it sounds a lot like a complex mathematical theory that you're trying to learn. It's not, but you're immediately put off because of the word. Um, and then you also have this thing where you're trying to identify what that word means. Uh, for example, what is functional programming? If you, if you look, at, look it up online, you'll find millions of definitions for FP, and uh, they, some of them are conflicting. Uh, and they all are very verbose uh, and very hard to visualize. And I feel like most of the definitions online are more about the characteristics of FP rather than what it is, actually. Um, so this is one of the things that put me off, and it's the same thing with any, any of the jargon that you actually find in FP. You, you look for a definition, you pretty much find thousands of it, and you can't understand what it says. Um, you can't implement them. Um, the next thing was, uh, as I said before, my, the, the team's code base had a lot of functional code in it, so I used to learn something and go back and look at it. Which uh, and, and try to read it, try to understand what that code did. Um, and this uh, was a bit problematic for me because FP is not really easy to read for a beginner. It has a lot of hidden things in it, uh, at least for, from a beginner perspective, that's how it feels like. Um, so not easy reading, and that's why the, the confidence level on, on the learning just plummets. Um, Another thing I figured out was the slow learning aspect of it, because when I started with the team, uh, I expected to grasp FP concepts in like one month. That didn't happen. <laughs> it took way more than that. 
Um, so that expectation that you're going to be, um, you're going to master FP is that sort of works against you in learning FP. Um, so at this point, I was I was ready to give up. I, I sort of felt like I was I'm an idiot. I can't I can't do FP. Uh, this is not for me. Um, but so the main problem here was like I would understand a concept from the book or the video tutorial, but I could not implement it on a real real world application uh, sort of way. I could not implement anything to or contribute to my company code base. So that's where I was having a problem. Um, so at this point, I actually did ask for help. Um, but luckily, uh, I work for a company, uh, REA Group in Melbourne, and they have this very large FP community that's really friendly. Um, we have an active Slack channel that, that we, there's discussions every day on it. Um, there are 128 members, and we're always discussing uh, FP concepts. And the beauty about it is you could, you could ask a stupid question, well, not a stupid question, but a simple question, a beginner question, and you would immediately get help from them. People are willing to e explain it to you, to pair with you, to make you understand the concept, so they really helped. Um, so I had this, uh, so I got a couple of mentors. I had one mentor who, who suggested this to me. Uh, why don't you do a side project, but do, do a game, a simple game sort of thing? So the difference between um, doing any side project uh, versus a game, like any mathematical uh, project versus a game, is that in a game, your interest is engaged, and you can always evolve it, um, evolve it to include different scenarios, different rules. You can have different players sort of thing. And it doesn't have to be a complex um, you know, role-playing game sort of thing. It's, it's, it could be a very simple thing. So this is what, what I did. Um, and the game that I chose to start working on from scratch was the Cows and Bulls game. And I actually came up with this uh, just now. I saw this app on an Android App Store. They, ha they have the same game called Cows and Bulls uh, on App Store. You could probably check it out. It's a very simple game. Uh, it's a guessing game. So basically, you have like a secret number, and you're supposed to guess it sort of thing. So this is what I'm trying to achieve with my learning uh, functional programming aspect of it. Maybe you could do something similar, something simple, um, but equally effective. So uh, as I said, this, the side projects which, uh, which you do, like a game, really keeps your interest in. You, you really want to work on it the next time, and it doesn't frustrate you. Um, another aspect of this sort of learning is that um, it, it encourages the philosophy of learn when needed, um, mostly because when you look at books or video tutorials, you have a structure in which you learn something. You have, um, if you look at the index page, that's exactly how you go about learning it. But this way of learning, you're actually going to need a functional programming concept to use. And then you go, go find out what it is. You look at how it's being used, and then you use it. So this is more uh, consolidated learning, um, and I think it's really helpful for people, especially beginners, to FP to do. Um, mostly because uh, learning FP is not exactly the same as learning another computer language. Um, if you're learning another programming language, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with um, swapping out syntaxes or um, you know, just, just modifying your concept. But FP is more than that. Um, so once I started doing it, uh, I had to revisit this page where what is functional programming? So if you ask people about this, uh, they'll all have different answers. Um, so my answer is probably different too, uh, because functional programming for me is a programming mindset. It's, it's the way you think about code. Um, and the one thing about FP is that it forces you to think about code. Uh, it has this uh, unique feature where uh, when you look at a functional code, you see that it's about what that code does. It's not about how that code's being done, because that's, that part is a bit hidden, which is what makes reading functional code a bit difficult. So, um, so what happens to a programmer using functional, uh, functional programming is that 
you you have to focus on a small aspect of your of your function of what you want your code to do. Uh, you think about it really intensely, and then you write the code. Um, it's not it's not easy, and it takes a lot of uh, practice, at least for me, to actually get to the stage where I'm confidently uh, smashing out functions. Never happened, but yeah. So that's that's the way uh, I feel functional programming is. Um, so. Why do we care? So I feel like this is also something that I can't just tell you and expect you to accept. Uh, this is more about you practicing functional code and then realizing why, what are the advantages to it. Because anyone can say it's uh, clean, it's elegant, um, it, it's, the number of lines are smaller, or um, it's modularization and things like that. But uh, these are my reasons. But if you really want to understand why you would use functional code, you have to try it. Uh, try writing uh, a simple game program and then see, see if you like it or not. I'm pretty certain, 100% certain you will. Um, so a few things that stood out for me while learning functional programming, uh, I'd like to share them with you. Um, you'd probably come across the same thing. Uh, the first thing was this. Mutability and immutability. Um, so, mu Im so what happens is like in immutability, uh, you basically have an array and if you want to add elements to it, you create a new array and then w with the updated elements, but you keep the old array. So that's sort of like immutability. Um, so why do we use immutability and mutability? So I might uh, get some opposition on this, but I feel um, when you're doing mutable, when you're dealing with mutable data, uh, you're leaving your data unprotected, sort of. You, you're leaving it a bit open-ended um, because that data has the opportunity to mutate into something, uh, especially when your code is expanding. And the thing as a programmer is you might not be aware of it. So when that, when that happens, it usually leads to like bugs and it, it's, it's a pain to debug. Um, so that's where the immutability aspect really helps because you're kind of like setting boundaries or um, you know closing that sort of scenario, saying that this is your this data will not change. So at any point in time, even if the code expands, you kind of know what your data is going to be. Uh, so that that was really striking to me. Um, uh, and the next thing, this is this is also very obvious to beginners in FB. Uh, is the recursion aspect of it. Where did all the for loops go? You see this everywhere. So, um, I had, so the problem I had with recursion is writing recursion. I could understand it, I can read it, but writing recursion uh, is a bit different because you, when you look at uh, blog posts or book, books and read books, you kind of come across uh, recursion examples as mathematical. You get like factorial or Fibonacci series, uh, and that makes sense. But when you're looking at your uh, real world application and you want to use recursion, that's where I usually get stuck. So I kind of learned this new trick. Um, it's, it's basically the way you think in recursion, and it's, it's sort of like this. You have a collection of data, um, data elements that you want to do something with. Uh, so you write a function that takes that in as an input, and you do two things. The first thing is, what do you do with the last element? You write an ending uh, argument or function or return something. In this case, you're returning uh, accumulated. And then you have another state where you're dealing with the rest of the elements. Uh, and this is usually where the recursion uh, call is also happening. And then finally, you just return the function, right? Um, so this is like a trick that I learned to, to actually implement uh, tail recursion. and it, works, so maybe you could use that. Um, this is another thing. I see a lot of this in my company code base, a lot of one-liners, and I remember the first time I actually looked at it, this was one of those things that kind of like uh, gave me that sinking feeling, um, because I literally went, I have, I, I know what it's trying to do, but I have no idea how, how it's doing it. It's, it's doing something with a list, uh, it's mapping it, map redu reducing it, and then combining it to get another list or something. So, um, but the thing about one-liners is, is the more you, you do functional code, the easier it becomes to read it, and easier it is to implement it. 
Uh, so me personally, the first one-liner I did was the reading from the console and then converting, uh, converting it to, to, a, to a list, to digits. Um, so this, this is an example of how something can look intimidating, but it's not actually. Um, and the more you, more you learn about it, the more you think about it, you sort of get into the habit of writing it. Um, it's also very compact, very neat. Uh, it, and that's why I think more type less sort of thing comes in. Um, and when one-liners get too busy, there's, there's another uh, way you can write it, and that's using full comprehensions. I did not know about full comprehensions before. Um, so that's another thing that I learned. Um, so this is actually, people talk about map filter uh, a lot, so, but I want to talk about this zip uh, tool, which is, which is an FP tool. And this is rather special because this is the first time I actually used an FP concept uh, while I was doing the Cousin Bulls game. The first time I used it because I needed it. And that's how the learning started. This is how the learning started. I had this um, uh, secret number and this guest number, and I wanted to find this element that, had, uh, that was in the same position to see if they matched. And Zip actually helped with that. So um, this is an example of how, how you actually learn and consolidate your FV concepts while doing a game, because it's interesting and it's very enjoyable to do. Um, Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but for me, this is like one of the major things about FP. Um, so this is like a C++ code that prints out the happy birthday lyrics. Um, I attempted to do it in Scala, and that's what it looks like. It's literally one line. And for me, that's really exciting. So um, taking a look at how my learning is now uh, compared to everything, everything that I've done, all the all the pain <laughs> that I've gone through, and also the help that I've received from uh, different people. Uh, how's it going now? It's going really well. And you can see there's like a, it's a slow learning uh, progress, but the interest is more and more every day. Um, and the more you actually get into it, you know, cryptic concepts like monads or applicatives, they don't scare you anymore. Uh, you know you, you can handle them. So it's sort of like this building block strategy where you kind of start with a smaller concept and then you, you start building, building into a bigger uh, you know, learning arsenal which can deal with like complex data. So it, it really works. Um, so these are like the helpers that I have for you. Um, these are the things that I actually went through and maybe you've gone through the same. Um, reading thousands of books. I remember I was sitting uh, at, at a place and I had these people kept sending me references uh, to links and things that they found really helpful and I kept looking at all of them. I think I read almost all that everyone's given me. Uh, it doesn't help because um, it's, it's sort of like your memory about something and then it, you're writing on top of it, uh, nothing is retained. Um, and in the end, at the end of the day, it's just like a confusing spaghetti ball. Um, video tutorials, there, there is amazing, uh, good, very good courses on uh, Coursera about functional programming uh, and Scala or Haskell. Um, but there was this one time where I was like uh, looking at this video tutorial that was 15 minutes long um, and I watched it for five times, not on the same day, thank God, but I watched it for five times and, and that's when I realized it wasn't working. Um, and I watched it for five times because people told me it was good. So I, I was like, is there something wrong with me? This, this is like people are talking about this so much. Um, but then you, you look at the people who are talking about it and they've been doing FP for a while, so they feel it's good. But it might be a different story for a beginner, a complete beginner to FP. Um, so, and then another thing was uh, when I joined, I accidentally kind of walked into this uh, advanced FP talk. It said on the note that it, that it was an advanced FP talk. I kind of ignored it, still went in, uh, bad idea because it was one hour um, of me thinking 
I am never going to get FBA again, only because um, you know it, it, it was really hard to understand. I couldn't. I could probably get um, maybe ten words in that whole lecture, so maybe don't do that. Um, okay, so this is something I'm really guilty of. Uh, when I started FBA, I immediately started looking up what a monad was, uh, and that's a really bad idea. It immediately puts you off. Um, so probably don't pursue cryptic cryptic concepts like monads uh, and stick to something simpler. Um, okay, so I do this too. I get, I look at the literal definitions of terms um, because I'm, I'm a researcher, so I have this thing where I need to like research where the background of every term is from and that's a bad idea again um, because they have conflicting definitions and they don't actually tell you how to use it. Um, sure, there are like examples uh, about how to use it, but the thing is like when you want to use that concept to your application, that's where you run into a problem. Um, so that's what I went through. Uh, and expecting the learning to be fast. Uh, I, I feel like that's also something I'm guilty of. I expected to grasp FP concept, like it's only math. I mean, how hard can it be? It is hard. <laughs> it's not math. Um, so that's another thing that you probably shouldn't do. It's going to be slow. Um, and the last thing is me trying to always contribute to the company code base, um, and that doesn't help because it's already functional, and you can't. And when I'm trying to add something, um, there's like all these all these people standing over me saying uh, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so maybe don't do that. Um, so what did help? Uh, games, I cannot emphasize how great uh, programming games is to learn functional programming. Uh, it, it, it gives you like the sense of freedom where you actually want to go back home and do this, do this thing where you're learning, where, where you're doing games. Uh, you're very interested in it. You want to try out different things and you can use the, the learn when needed approach. Um, because you run into something and then you want to use NFP concept and then you use it. This way, that, that concept that you're using, you kind of consolidate into your brain. Um, again, start with the simpler concepts like uh, how to pass a function into a function or maybe even recursion. So start with like simpler concepts and then you can slowly build your FP arsenal. Um, and the next two are something that really helped me, mentor sessions and discussions. Uh, people in the FP community are really, really fun to talk to and they're very friendly and they're always willing to have a discussion on, uh, on their concepts. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, talk to someone who's already practicing FP if you're, if you're keen on learning. Um, so hopefully my talks, talk has actually inspired you to start learning FP. I've got, got a few resources. Um, I'm guessing these slides will be online at some point, so I can add some more, uh, some things that I actually did find useful. Um, thanks for listening. Questions? Yes. Can you give us a demo of the game? Uh, uh, the games, I've just recently changed the game. Um, so it's, it's not, I'm sorry. But I can actually uh, try for you after this is done. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm just curious about um, your programming background prior. Yeah. Learning yeah. And also put on you for pushing through. Um, so question is, uh, <laughs> Uh, you want to know my programming background? Um, so I did Swift. Uh, I was doing iOS development before. Um, and before that, I had I'd done C++ a bit. That's it. I, I'm kind of new to this whole programming world, um, which is why I feel like I kind of have more trouble than usual. Um, but it's, it's definitely doable. Like, if I can do it, I'm pretty sure everyone can. Any more questions? Yeah? How long was it from you starting to feeling confident you could complete anything? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, how long was it before I feel confident to actually complete uh, any, any functional programming thing? 
Um, so the thing is, like, uh, I joined this team about six months ago. And the first month was, the end of the first month was where I was going to give up. I think three months from when I started programming games is when I started feeling confident I could do it. But that's also only when I've kind of grasped only the simpler aspects of FP. Um, and I'm still learning, you know, the more complex aspects now. So it, it takes a long time. It's a slow learning process, but uh, it takes a lot of dedication. And I've put in probably about like seven days a week sort of thing into this. Um, but it's still not enough uh, most of the time because uh, I, my background's not, I, I, like, I've done electronics engineering. <laughs> uh, but so it's not easy for me uh, in a programming aspect. But... Uh, it's been going well, um, so I'm, I'm sure it won't take that long for others. Any more? Okay. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, please give a warm hand to Mira.